Um, yeah, so I'm going to just give a, an overview of the status of uh, reef health in the Bahamas and talk a little bit about some recent trends that we've been seeing. Um, and this is work I've done with um, many of the individuals and organizations in this room, um, in particular, uh, Krista Sherman, and then Judy Lang and Patricia Kramer from AGRA. Uh, so just want to go over why we really care about reefs in the Bahamas. And there's the, the obvious reasons that they are, um, in terms of biodiversity, have the greatest biodiversity of uh, ecosystems in the Bahamas. Um, and also their importance for ecologically and economically uh, important species, but also some facts that many of you might not know is that the Bahamas has the most coral reef area of any nation in the Caribbean region. Um, and then the Andros Barrier Reef, uh, an area that we have uh, featured in this study quite a bit, is one of the world's largest contiguous reef systems. So the Bahamas really is a, a coral reef nation. Um, not to go into too many details, but we have surveyed reefs using the Atlantic uh, and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment methods, um, where we get a very good picture of the, the overall condition or health of a reef, um, because we're looking at a number of different aspects of it. So we're looking at uh, what's growing on the seafloor, the percent cover of different organisms. Uh, we're looking in detail at coral populations, both the species compositions and aspects of the populations themselves in terms of their sizes of individual corals, their condition um, and recruitment rates. And then we also look at density and sizes for key fish and invertebrate species. So from 2011 to 2014, um, over uh, about 214 sites from around the Bahamas were surveyed using these methods um, with the help of a number, again, of different individuals and organizations contributing to this. Um, but we have a pretty good spread across the Bahamas from uh, sites off of Grand Bahama and Southern Abaco uh, down to Great Inagua and from Key Sal over to East Planaki and Samanaki. So we have a, a good overview of the entire range of the Bahamas. Um, let me just go back for a second. Um, so uh, to start with, just looking at the benthic communities, um, what we see here, if we look at uh, first the amount of live coral cover on the reefs, um, and the graphs I'm going to show all kind of follow the same pattern where on the x-axis there's the different regions where we conducted the surveys so all the individual site data is combined into regions. Um, the response variables on the y-axis and then there's generally three bars for each graph. One is the shallow, uh, going from shallow to deep and for um, for our purposes, shallow is right in the reef crest area, so only a couple feet deep. Um, the next is uh, patch reefs in the 10 to 15 to 20 foot depth range. And then the far right bar in each grouping is uh, four reef areas, so uh, 30 to 60 feet in general. And what we see is that uh, we do have some variability uh, among the different reef zones. Uh, and among the different areas, but in general, the percent cover of live coral in the Bahamas um, range from about 7 to 17 percent. Um, so really not 100 percent like in this picture. Uh, looking at the percent cover of macroalgae in these areas, we see a different story, and I'm just going to point out that this y-axis is a much different scale from this one. Um, so we're seeing 23 to 75% uh, cover of macroalgae on reefs. So what we're calling coral reefs in the Bahamas um, were probably formed by corals, but nowadays they're more resembling this than, than this. Um, and I put this in to just show that this isn't just the Bahamas. Um, if we were to do these surveys back in the 1970s, we would have seen at least 35% cover of live coral on these reefs. 
Um, but throughout the, the Caribbean region, we see that there's been a, a serious decline. Um, in the Bahamas, the decline has uh, been a little bit greater than other parts of the Caribbean, though. Uh, other parts of the Caribbean being around 17, 18 percent coral, and here 10 to 12 percent coral. So what's caused the decline? Um, there's a number of different contributing factors. Uh, probably the, the largest is um, thermal stress. Uh, when sea temperatures get too warm, uh, the corals respond by expelling the microscopic symbiotic zooxanthellae, uh, microalgae that live inside their tissues, and the coral uh, looks bleached white like this. Um, during these bleaching events, if they're um, long in duration or severe in terms of the amount of temperature stress, the corals will die. So um, you'll have a, a large coral head here like this one that's over three meters across that um, maybe took a thousand years to grow, definitely hundreds of years, um, and it can die over a period of days basically. Um, and what we saw in 1998 uh, during the last severe El Nino year until this current one, um, in some parts of the Bahamas, over 50% of the corals died over the course of a summer um, and continued to die afterwards due to disease and other things. Um, and disease uh, can occur not just during these El Nino events, diseases. Uh, this one has a coral with black band disease. Uh, the white is dead coral skeleton. Can rapidly spread across a coral. Um, and generally during these warm periods, the spread of disease is greater because the corals are already stressed, we think. Um, but disease can, can happen at any time due to a number of different factors. Um, another thing that's contributed to the loss of corals are coral predators. Um, and there's a number of things out there that eat corals, and uh, one of the, the things that is uh, a major predator on some species are these little snails, uh, Coraliophylla abbreviata. Um, they not only consume massive amounts of corals, um, particularly on some of the big branching corals, but they also uh, can be a vector for disease as well. Um, there's also a number of organisms that can overgrow corals, uh, from macroalgae to this is a, a colonial uh, tunicate that can overgrow and kill corals. And then last but certainly not least, um, we have human impacts, which can uh, range from direct physical impacts to corals, um, vessel groundings, anchor damage, that kind of thing, to uh, inappropriate development, which can cause increase in nutrients or sediments on a reef that can essentially uh, kill the corals. So the reefs are, are faced with multiple uh, threats or stressors um, that interact with each other. Uh, so they really have been hit by many things all at once uh, recently. So the next question we wanted to ask with the data is, well, we know that there was major die-offs back in, in the 90s. Um, are reefs recovering? So we looked at coral recruits to address that question. And what we see here is, um, looking at this top graph, uh, the blue bars are the very small coral recruits, coral recruits less than two centimeters in diameter, and the red are two to four centimeter in diameter corals. And what we see is that in, in some areas, we, we are seeing um, significant amounts of new coral recruits. Um, but in other areas, not so much. We do see coral settling, but not surviving to older sizes. Um, the other thing that we found, though, that's even more alarming is that nearly all of the coral recruits that we're seeing are from weedy species. So they're not from major reef building species like some of the larger branching corals or um, mounding corals or brain corals. They're more these encrusting species that really don't contribute a lot to reef growth. Um, so we're seeing a shift in species uh, recovery on reefs, where some of the, the ones that we really want to see recover are not doing that yet. Um, and 
I put this in just to show that this is not uh, unique to the Bahamas. This is kind of typical of, of what's happening in the Caribbean. Um, these are the, the three different depth zones, and we see Bahamas and Caribbean very similar. If anything, the Bahamas might have slightly more uh, recruitment. Um, but in general, the same sort of story going on. So the next question is, um, why this very limited recovery? Um, and there's two main reasons for that. And uh, the first is that as corals have uh, died on reefs, the population's been thinned out. The way corals reproduce is by um, the major reef building corals are broadcast spawners. So they really need to have uh, colonies occurring at a uh, density sufficient to ensure that there is fertilization of gametes that they release. Um, and as the population gets thinned, we really don't see that as much. Uh, more importantly, though, is back to the, the algae story, where the reefs are now covered by algae, and it just uh, eliminates the space for coral larvae to settle to the reef. Um, and when it does find a space to settle, it can be overgrown rapidly by the algae and killed. So why are the reefs then dominated by macroalgae is the question. And um, the main reason for that is the loss of this major uh, grazing animal, um, the long-spined sea urchin diadema. Uh, back in the 70s, up until 1982-83, uh, densities around the Caribbean for this animal were up to four per meter square, and that density was sufficient to keep seaweeds at background levels, um, really clear space for corals to settle on the reef. Uh, in 1983, though, there was a pathogen that uh, spread throughout the Caribbean that nearly wiped out this species entirely, um, and it still hasn't really recovered in the past 30-plus years since it died off. Uh, looking at the Bahamas um, from shallow to deep reefs compared to the Caribbean, we see that uh, Densities are nowhere near that four per meter squared. Um, really, densities are almost zero at the deep reefs in the Bahamas and only starting to recover at one per 10 meters squared in the shallow reefs. And um, while throughout the Caribbean, uh, average densities are about the, um, are still depressed, um, they are starting to recover more in some of these other areas and less in the Bahamas. Um, what we do have going for us in the Bahamas, though, is that the, the next most important grazer are these large parrotfish. Um, the pa parrotfish species that get to be 30 centimeters or more are also capable of removing seaweeds from the reef fairly effectively, not as effectively as the urchins, but fairly effectively. And what we see is, um, again, we have a big range of uh, densities of these large parrotfish um, between areas and across different reef zones. Um, but the, the take-home message here for the parrotfish is that uh, we have a lot more in the Bahamas than, than other parts of the Caribbean. And the main reason for that is, is fishing. Um, parrotfish haven't been a traditional fishery species in the Bahamas, um, but over the past five to ten years or so, this is becoming an emerging problem where fishers are increasingly targeting uh, these very important large parrotfish species. One of the reasons for that may be declines in other more traditional fishery species, like large groupers. So we looked at large grouper stocks around the Bahamas. Um, and this includes Nassau grouper, black grouper, yellowfin grouper, all the, the major commercial species. And we see that um, uh, across the Bahamas, densities did vary a lot. Um, not surprisingly, the, the greatest densities by uh, two to five fold were in the Exuma Keys, where most of our sites were in the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park. Um, so the park's been very effective uh, at protecting large groupers. Um, and just looking at comparing the Bahamas to the Caribbean, if we look at uh, small size classes, uh, less than 40 centimeters, the densities in the Bahamas and Caribbean are very similar. But when we start adding in these large groupers, uh, over 40 centimeters, we see a there's basically been wiped out through the rest of the Caribbean, and really in the Bahamas we have quite a bit. Um, and these are the ones that are the, the reproductive ones, the, the large spawners. Um, but like uh, Krista 
uh, mentioned and Christine mentioned in their talks yesterday about Nassau Group, where we are seeing a uh, decline in those as well. So um, conditions are good right now, but we are starting to see them trend downward. So um, just to kind of wrap things up, the conclusions um, and all of this information and a lot more is presented in this uh, coral reef report card that we completed for the Bahamas. And this is something that's um, being released uh, this week um, and is available on the Atlantis Blue Project uh, website, blueprojectatlantis.org. But we see um, some very positive things with well, cautiously positive things with uh, fish populations in the Bahamas. Um, but we have uh, low coral cover, low coral recruitment, and we've lost one of the major gra grazers that reduces the resilience of our reefs here. Um, the reefs here are facing a number of ongoing threats, but we are, can implement strategies that uh, can help um, combat these threats and uh, prevent reefs from declining further and actually helping them recover. And we saw an example with Dr. Ray's talk about a marine protected area and how that can do that last night. And then I'm out of time, so I'll just uh, wrap up just thanking all the, the people, uh, many people and many organizations that contributed to this research. Thanks.